It's time for the verdict. The verdict is a lively discussion of current events and legal issues pertinent to Oklahomans. The verdict is hosted by Kent Myers and Mick Cornett. The verdict is sponsored in part by the Able Law Firm. It's time for the verdict. And welcome once again to The Verdict. I'm Mick Cornett, and I am joined, as always, by one of Oklahoma's top legal experts, Kent Myers. Kent, what do we have in store today? Uh, an exciting show, uh, spawned in part by some of Senator Hobson's remarks last week. But we are going to explore uh, this week why so many women in Oklahoma are incarcerated when you look at the uh, comparison to other states surrounding and in the nation in general. Uh, we have uh, held the number one ranking on a per capita basis for 11 straight years now, and uh, the legislature has uh, recently enacted legislation uh, forming a special task force to look into it. We have two of the task force members with us today, the Honorable Mary Fallon, the Lieutenant Governor of the State of Oklahoma, and Rob Wallace, the President of the Oklahoma District Attorneys Association. Uh, they're going to be with us uh, telling us uh, what they're doing, why they're doing it, and what they're finding. Well, should be a good show, and we'll get to it. This morning, Lieutenant Governor Mary Fallon and the President of the Oklahoma District Attorneys Association, Rob Wallace, will be here to discuss the high number of women that are serving time in our prison system. It's next on The Verdict. The Journal Record is pleased to be a sponsor of The Verdict. The Journal Record. Since 1903, the best source of Oklahoma business news and legal information. St. Gregory's University has been changing the lives of people like me for 125 years. Affordable, private Catholic education, balanced with dedication to community and service, makes St. Gregory special. We're extremely proud of our students' outstanding academic achievements and our nationally ranked athletic teams. It's when you help a student build a future of balance, integrity, and service that you change a life forever. St. Gregory's, a community for life. American Express Tax and Business Services. We're accountants. We do taxes, business valuations, estate planning, and consulting. And we're right here in Oklahoma, working with the owners of small and medium-sized businesses. Steve Wilsey and Stuart Meyer have the resources and the experience. American Express Tax and Business Services. In Oklahoma City, the phone number is 405-843-5311. Choose Live license plates are now available for only $25. $20 of each plate sold will go towards help making adoption a more viable option in Oklahoma. Visit your local tag agency or www.choosedlife.org and download an application today. For more information, visit the website on your screen. Welcome back to The Verdict. Mick Cornett with Kent Myers is going to introduce our guests. We are pleased to have two guests today to discuss the uh, incarceration of women in Oklahoma. Across the table from me is a frequent return visitor to the, to the verdict, the Honorable Mary Fallon, the Lieutenant Governor of the State of Oklahoma. I'll remind our viewers that uh, Governor Fallon was the first woman elected the Lieutenant Governor in Oklahoma and the first Republican yes, sir. Lieutenant Governor. And she's been elected three times, uh, born and raised in Tecumseh graduated from Oklahoma State University, was in the House of Representatives four years, mm -hmm. has been the chairman of the National Conference of Lieutenant Governors, has a daughter uh, Christine and a son Price, and we welcome you very much uh, back to the verdict, you Lieutenant You did Governor. a good background check on me. <laughs> well, I know I... we're talking about criminal justice today, Rob. They did a good background <laughs> yes, check. Yes, Rob Thank helped you. me a lot on yeah. that. Yeah. <laughs> uh, to my right Glad to be back. is a uh, first-time visitor to the verdict, but I hope not the last time, uh, the Honorable Rob Wallace, who is the District Attorney of the 16th District, which is LaFleur and Latimer Counties. Uh, Rob lives in Poto, is an OU uh, uh, undergraduate and law school graduate, is the current president of the Oklahoma District Attorneys Association, also is a professor, an adjunct professor at Carl Albert State College, teaching criminal law. 
And over the past 14 years has in, been involved both as a defense attorney and as a prosecutor in the criminal justice area. He's married uh, to Tanya with three children, and I hope they're listening, Anthony, uh, Kara, and Nana. Uh, we're going to take good care of your dad while he's here. Uh, thank you, Rob, for joining us. It's my pleasure. Thank you for having me. We uh, have a lighthearted introduction, but a somber topic, mm -hmm. uh, and that is women being incarcerated in Oklahoma at, at, at astronomical rates. I know the uh, legislature has passed Senate Bill 810, which uh, st uh, created the special task force uh, with which you all are aff affiliated. Of course, uh, uh, Lieutenant Governor, you've been elected the chairperson of that. Can you tell us who are the other members generally? Well, generally, the, the members on the task force, and let me just say that the status of the Commission of Women had requested the legislature to run some legislation to establish this task force to look at why we incarcerate such a high number of women into our prison system. But we have appointments from the House of Representatives, from the Senate, we have representatives from the Criminal Justice Resource Center, from the District Attorney's Council. We also have them from uh, the Department of Corrections, from uh, Human Services. And um, I think that covers most of the designees that are on that, that council, and of course myself. Well, let's look at what the legislature gave to the task force as a purpose. So I'd like to call up a graphic, if I may. The, uh, the special task force for women incarcerated in Oklahoma's purpose is to try to determine what factors cause the high incarceration rate, including, but not necessarily limited to, education, literacy level, gender bias, and other state policies. Uh, that's quite a purpose that you've uh, charged with. Uh, I know that you have to report to the legislature in February of 2004. Uh, how's it going? Well, we've had two meetings so far, and we got five more still to go. The first meeting that we had, we uh, studied some preliminary data and statistics and information. We had people come and testify. We received information about how many women are incarcerated, what they're incarcerated for, uh, what's their length of their terms, and, and basic information like that. The second meeting that we had uh, about a week and a half ago was on drug courts and their effectiveness. And then we also had a lot of public comment, in which, as you can imagine, there were a lot of people that wanted to come and give public comment. And that's an important part of what we're doing. We'll be looking at other states' experiences. We'll hopefully be going and, and looking at some uh, programs that are in the state and how those work, continuing to look at the underlying causes, the, the roots of why we have uh, that many women incarcerated in our prison systems and, and what some of the short-term solutions will be and what some of the long-term okay. solutions will be, and of course to make a recommendation back to the legislature in February. Okay. Rob, you can do a lot of things with statistics, but this was startling to me. If you look at the number of women who were incarcerated in the United States in 1980, and you look at the number that were incarcerated in the year 2000, it has increased sevenfold. What's going on? Well, I think, uh, Mick, that it, it's uh, a symptom of something that's going on culturally all across the country. Uh, interestingly enough, we're seeing a, a significant increase in the number of young girls in the juvenile justice system, for instance. So it's something that's starting at a young age and, and they're pursuing those careers on into their adult life. We're seeing an increased gang activity around, uh, among young ladies. Uh, and it's just an indication, I think, that, that uh, the girls are trying to catch up to the guys in criminal justice behavior. Well, what types of offenses are these women uh, creating for themselves? As a district attorney, what do you see in, in your, coming through your we, courts? We see a broad range uh, of the type of criminal behavior we're talking about. Now, we know that in this state we incarcerate an awful lot of people uh, on drug-related crimes. Uh, that's true of men and women. Uh, and there doesn't seem to be that big of a difference uh, statistically in, uh, in terms of a gender break in those drug-related crimes. However, what we see also is that most of what we do in a prosecutor's office is somehow related to substance abuse, whether it be alcohol or other drugs. And so it's not, we don't believe, unusual for us to see an increase uh, uh, in women's representation uh, in, in that population because it's consistent across the board in the criminal justice system. Let me, let me ask you a follow-up on that. Uh, <clears throat> are women committing violent crimes at the same rate uh, that men agree? Uh, absolutely, them? absolutely. And, and uh, that, that's one of the, the scary things about these increased statistics. We're seeing increased uh, firearm usage. We're seeing increased dangerous weapon usage among women. Uh, in fact, we have a, a lady incarcerated for life without parole out of LaFleur County that uh, the Kathy Lamb case that received some notoriety a few years ago when the parole board voted to commute her sentence to life. Uh, 
uh, and Governor Keating uh, saw fit to do what the jury said, and that's leave her in for life without uh, parole. Uh, and, and that's an indication just in a rural county uh, of some of what we're seeing. It, it doesn't seem to break on gender lines. Well, I was going to ask that. Do, do juries seem to uh, uh, come to similar decisions without regard to gender? Well, I, I, you know as well as I do that when you get in the, in the courtroom with a jury, uh, the, the appearance of the person sitting at the table can very often make a difference in the outcome of the trial. Uh, and I think it's fair to say that uh, a, a woman sitting at uh, the defense table in a jury trial uh, is probably uh, in a situation of having a better chance of not going to prison than a male sitting at that table. And I think that's why the, the prison population in this state is, is something on the order of uh, 23,000. Uh, and yet in 2002, only 10 percent of that population was actually female. So I, I think they're underrepresented in the population because of that very fact. Well, district attorneys are elected officials. And I, I don't think I've ever heard a district attorney who was running for election say they're going to be soft on crime. So uh, how do we solve this problem if the district attorneys are not going to say we're going to change our attitude toward women in the criminal justice system? Well, first of all, I think we have to define that we have a problem. Uh, to, call it, to, yeah. to call it a problem is to say that we've got women in prison in Oklahoma that don't deserve to be in prison. Uh, and under the law as it is in this state right now, we don't believe that's the case. Uh, women uh, are, are treated consistently across the board by prosecutors just like men going into the system uh, and are receiving the same type of treatment uh, as their cases progress in the criminal justice system as men. Uh, and, and it would be our position that that the women that are in the prison need to be in the prison. Lieutenant Governor, I want to draw your attention to a graphic. This shows the number of women per capita that are incarcerated in Oklahoma and the surrounding states. And we'll look clockwise, starting with Kansas. Per 100,000 women in the state of Kansas, there are 36 women in their penal system incarcerated. And then Missouri has 73, Arkansas 57, Louisiana 99, Texas 96, New Mexico 50, and Colorado 62. And then you see the very large number in the middle, Oklahoma, with a, a number that's uh, double what some of those states are. And, and to me, this is startling because if it were a regional issue, uh, you know, it would show up it in, would show in a map up. like this. Right. It, it seems to be an Oklahoma issue. Well, and the interesting part about this statistic, it's 130 per 100,000 mm -hmm. in population of women. And my numbers say that back in 1993, we had 15 women per 100,000. And we are 124 percent higher than the national average of women that are incarcerated per capita per 100,000 people. So we are higher, 124 percent higher. And uh, in Oklahoma, just the statistics I have, that men that were 54 percent higher in the number of men and women that are incarcerated as a, as a joint figure. So yes, we're higher than our region. Uh, in, in per capita and some of the information I have uh, gleaned is that about 45 percent of our women that are in prison right now and incarcerated are in for substance abuse offenses and as uh, the DA will tell you many times there may be not only that substance abuse offense but there may be four or five other things grand larceny mm -hmm. petty theft uh, you know secondary manslaughter or whatever it might be along with that offense but many of them 45 percent or so we're in for uh, possession of drugs, a smaller, little smaller percentage, um, percentage for distribution, and then there's DUIs, alcohol-related offenses too. And what I, I seem to be discovering is, yes, we do have a high number of women in prison, but we also have a high number of women that uh, are getting involved in, in things they we shouldn't be involved problem. with an addiction yeah. problem. And one of the other figures that I discovered, and there's a, a great article in the Farmers Union uh, monthly publication, but it says uh, Oklahoma has experienced a 9,000 percent increase over the past five years of meth lab seizures. Absolutely. And the statistics I looked at about our women being incarcerated on substance abuse offenses mainly have uh, of those convictions are meth lab versus cocaine, because they probably can't afford it. It's cheaper to make, I, I assume, That's methamphetamine right. and easier. I was telling Rob, you know, women kind of like to cook, so <laughs> I don't know. It's my, my guess. But I think some of it could be related to the substance abuse problems that we have in our state, the meth lab problems that we've been experiencing. Mm -hmm. And we saw a direct correlation between the increase in meth lab seizures and growth in our state and actually the women incarcerated going up. If, if you I need to jump in here and get us to a break, sure. Rob. We'll let you start when we get back. Sure. We're visiting with Rob Wallace and Lieutenant Governor Mary Fallon. We'll be right back. You're watching The Verdict.
bringing out the best in each student. That is the simple goal and tradition of Heritage Hall. The focus on the individual shapes the educational experience at Heritage Hall. Each student benefits from small classes, able, dedicated teachers, a solid academic curriculum, and exceptional co-curricular programs of athletics, arts, community service, and other activities, parental involvement, personalized counseling, and the development of responsibility, integrity, and love of learning. If you want education taught with pride, then you want Heritage Hall. The Able Law Firm, based in Oklahoma City and recognized nationally for its superior legal ability and very high ethical standards. If you've been injured or believe someone you love has been a victim and needs to talk to an attorney, call the Able Law Firm. Initial consultations are free. The Able Law Firm. In Oklahoma City, the number is 239-7046. and guests back on the verdict this week we're examining an issue involving Oklahoma's criminal justice system as you may know on a per capita basis Oklahoma incarcerates more women than any other state in the nation how come we're visiting with Lieutenant Governor Mary Fallon and one of Oklahoma's district attorneys Rob Wallace who've been working on this issue and Rob you were going to speak about trends when we last left yeah Mick one of the uh, couple of interesting factors in the data that we're seeing right now is in the last couple of years we've actually trended down in terms of uh, true numbers of women in the system and in terms of percentage of the population being women in the prison system. So there seemed to be in the last couple of years uh, at least a slight shift uh, in the trend line for where we're headed in prison population. Of course, the population has been up and up, uh, but, but uh, we're at least plateauing and maybe even going down a little bit in terms of the number of women uh, in the total population. Uh, Lieutenant Governor Fallon touched upon the explosion of methamphetamine labs, and that is clearly part of what's going on here. If you look at states, that are seeing uh, explosions in the number of, of labs that they're seizing. Uh, and that's a regional phenomenon, primarily in Arkansas, Oklahoma, and Missouri, a little bit of Texas as well. If you look at those numbers, their uh, representation of women as a percentage of their prison population is also increasing. And they're also seeing tremendous increases in the number of, of uh, people that are incarcerated. Uh, the methamphetamine problem is a direct problem. Uh, in, in terms of the population at DOC, and that's something that we do need to focus on. Well, speaking of that, uh, are there other ways, uh, Lieutenant Governor, to, to correct or prosecute or punish uh, some of these offenders other than incarcerating them? Well, one of the things that we're finding has had success so far, and it's still a, a relatively new process, is the drug courts. And right now in Oklahoma, we have 24 counties that have drug courts and 10 that are trying to get their drug courts up and online. And I know DA Wallace has uh, his, his drug court also and could probably tell you more direct about experience with them. But in the information I've looked at, when a person, when a woman has the opportunity to go through a drug court, what we find is that women have about a 32% increase in employment once they go through the drug court and go through the substance abuse programs and get their GED and go out and look for employment that they have had an effect upon helping them get back into society, uh, getting, a, getting a job and being a, a, you know, a citizen again in the state of Oklahoma. And we also found that there's about a 130% increase in income from graduates, women graduates going through the drug courts too. So we're finding two positive things in that. One is that they have an increase in employment, increase in income, and that the recidivism rate is lower. It's about half for the men and the women who go through drug courts. The recidivism rate for the women who go through drug courts is about 14%, and for the men it's 21%. And typically it's about a 35% recidivism rate for repeat offenders once they come out of the system. Uh, according to some numbers I've seen. So there are some positive aspects. They're a relatively new concept. We have not instituted drug con 
drug courts throughout the state, but I think it's one of our, should be one of our goals is to get the funding, get the programs, get the training, you know, encourage uh, the uh, DAs and the, and the judges to look more at the drug courts and, and their effectiveness. Now, Rob, you have a drug court in your county? Yes, sir, Your do. counties? Yes. Uh, in a non-drug court criminal matter, the defendant walks in, uh, pleads guilty or not guilty, is tried, presumably, assuming there's no, no other uh, disposition. Jury decides up or down, and, and that's the end of it, assuming no successful appeal. What does a defendant uh, uh, face or encounter in a drug court? Well, first of all, they're going to have to plead guilty to the charge. Okay. Uh, a critical part of what goes on in drug court is obviously the treatment. Uh, and treatment's not going to work until you've got uh, a client uh, that recognizes they have a problem. So y you have some uh, limiting factors on who can get in. First of all, you have a, a very significant limits on what uh, the actual charge is. Uh, the the uh, federal guidelines as well as the state statute prohibit violent offenders, for instance, okay. from being able to get into drug court. Uh, and that's a defined term within the statute. But assuming you have a charge that qualifies, that person's going to enter a guilty plea. They're going to go on either a diversion path uh, out of the criminal justice system, or they're going to go on to a probation path inside the criminal justice system. A diversion system. path means if you don't get in any more trouble, your record's wiped clean? Is that's it? right. In okay. fact, there's no charge actually filed on that diversion path. Okay. Uh, most courts are going to a post-plea uh, form of, of the operation now, uh, as opposed to the pure diversion. And that's where someone comes in, actually, is charged, enters a guilty plea, and is put on a very specialized set of rules and conditions of probation. Within that is a, a, a very intensive treatment regime. Uh, in fact, they're going to get better treatment inside a drug court they're gonna, than they're going to get anywhere else outside of an inpatient setting. Uh, and within the context of that drug court, then, they're going to be drug tested uh, very regularly. In the first phase of that drug court program, they're going to be drug tested three times a week, for instance. But it's a very intensive probation that's designed to force break the addiction with prison as the sanction if they don't make it. I'd like to give each of you a chance to sum up your views on this topic. 20, 30 seconds. Lieutenant Governor Fallon, why don't you go first? Well, I see the purpose of our commission and our study is to look at uh, long-term solutions, the deeper underlying causes and workable solutions that we can implement and recommend to the legislature, and it's not going to go away overnight. I think first and foremost, our concern should be public safety, mm -hmm. that our goal should be to make sure our communities are safe, our families are safe, and the bad people you know, need to be put away uh, and, and locked up. Mm -hmm. And then secondly, I hope that uh, we recognize and understand that there may be some who see our task force as an opportunity to chip away at some of our budget problems by decriminalizing our criminal justice system. And we certainly don't want to do that either. You know, there are people who need to be put away. But let's look at the long-term solutions. Let's look at the undermining causes of why we're number one in the nation. There may be some short-term uh, solutions like the drug courts and funding for those things and uh, continue to study the issue. Mr. Wallace? Well, Mick, I, I, I think that uh, clearly we have to define that we have a problem first. As I mentioned earlier, we, we don't believe there's anybody in there that doesn't need to be there at this point. Uh, it's been said, uh, Senator Wilkerson said a couple of times, and a lot of us have said, you got to work your way into prison. Uh, we're not sending a lot of first-time offenders to prison. Uh, and, and I think the, the situation is that we have not uh, uh, what we perceive to be an overrepresentation of women in the system when, in fact, uh, they're there for good reason. Uh, I, I think that, that this is a symptom of an underlying problem that's much broader than just Department of Corrections. Uh, we need to be looking at uh, teen pregnancy rates, illiteracy rates, school dropout rates. And, and when you start to look at those things, what you'll see is there's a correlation between what we're doing on the front end for people and what we're having to do to people on the back end. And that's why we're getting this, this uh, aberration in the numbers. If we're going to look at alternatives to incarceration, to fixing this as a problem, then we're going to have to be willing to make the budget commitment it takes on the front end for these front end loaded pro uh, programs like drug courts and, and community sentencing. And until we make that commitment of resources, we can't expect the numbers to change. That's going to have to be the final word. Kent and I'll be back with another final word when we return. Thanks. children deserve a life of hope and love, but sometimes they experience a life of pain, neglect, and abuse. When that happens, 
Each child deserves all the quality, assistance, and representation that can be offered in our legal system. Oklahoma Lawyers for Children has over 500 of the best attorneys and volunteers who donate their time and service to represent children in Oklahoma County. For more information, call 23CHILD. Oklahoma Lawyers for Children, helping to bring hope and love back to the lives of abused children. The Able Law Firm, based in Oklahoma City and recognized nationally for its superior legal ability and very high ethical standards. If you've been injured or believe someone you love has been a victim and needs to talk to an attorney, call The Able Law Firm. Initial consultations are free. The Able Law Firm. In Oklahoma City, the number is 239-7046. Choose Live license plates are now available for only $25. For more information, visit the website on your screen. We're back to wrap up another edition of The Verdict. Ken, a really informative show. Yes, uh, a, a serious problem, but uh, congenial, uh, good guests, uh, Lieutenant Governor Fallon and uh, our district attorney, uh, President of the District Attorney's Council, uh, Rob Wallace. Uh, we uh, obviously have something going on in Oklahoma that, that may not be present elsewhere, at least in our surrounding states, because we uh, are uh, ending up with so many more per capita women uh, in prison than our neighbors. Uh, but uh, there's some explanations that make sense. The encouraging thing is that the, we have a commission that is uh, uh, well staffed and uh, will do a good job in trying to determine what are appropriate solutions uh, to try to perhaps have alternative punishments for some drug offenses uh, and nonviolent offenses that uh, might to cut down the incarceration rate. One, way, one thing we didn't get to talk about is what happens to the children mm -hmm. when uh, mommy and daddy go to jail and uh, that happens a lot and the, the answer is the state takes care of the children and unless there are other relatives that can do it but it's a sad sad story and one that we don't mean to make light of uh, mm -hmm. simply because of the large numbers well sure the social issue and the, and the, it weighs on our budget and we have we have budget problems at the it's, state level it's, too it impacts us many ways ken i'll be back next week with another show of the verdict we'll see you then with Kent Myers and Mick Cornett. The verdict is sponsored in part by the Able Law Firm.